Hi, I'm David Edelstein. I'm Alex Gibney. And we are here. It is my great pleasure to talk to Alex. I hope a friendly interrogation a about wording, please. his great documentary, Taxi to the Dark Side. Uh, he's also the director of Enron, the smartest guy in the room, which is uh, one of those documentaries in which uh, your jaw drops so low at the outlandish behavior of the uh, of the subjects that you think it needs to be surgically reconnected. I think we have another uh, another example of that with Taxi to the Dark Side. For people who don't uh, who don't know the premise of the film, uh, the taxi in question refers to an a, a hapless Afghani cab driver by the name of Dilawar who uh, gets picked up and uh, for very uh, convoluted reasons taken to uh, Bagram Air Force Base in uh, Afghanistan and winds up dying uh, pretty much at the hands of U.S. interrogators. Uh, the rather portentous sounding dark side of the title actually comes from Dick Cheney, sounding more like Lon Cheney, who, uh, who tells um, uh, an interviewer shortly after 9-11 that in order for the U.S. to win the war on terrorism, uh, we have to be prepared to go to the dark side. Ooh, sounds scary. Well, in fact, it is scary. And uh, in this great documentary, uh, Alex Gibney uh, begins with Delaware and uses him as a uh, taxi ride to the dark side, uh, going up the chain of command, determining how it was that uh, these soldiers could uh, tortured Dilawar with impunity, uh, then going higher yet to discuss the the history and the efficacy of torture before coming back around to Dilawar and his interrogators. So let me ask you this question, Alex. Um, what does it feel like to be nominated for an Oscar? And uh, what does it feel like to be nominated for an Oscar against a film you produced, uh, No End in Sight? If we can just start on a shallow note, get that sure. Out. Let's let's keep it as shallow as possible. I, I um, it feels good, though. I, I must say, I keep it in perspective. But I remember the last time I, I was nominated uh, before for Enron, and uh, two things kept me humble. One was I lost to a bunch of penguins, and two is that when I walked the red carpet with my wife, we thought, "Man, we have really arrived." Until a photographer screamed at me and said, "Get out of the way! Jennifer Aniston is coming." So I, I knew, you know, it was time to make my Which was the greater video. humiliation, Jennifer Aniston or the Penguins? <laughs> <laughs> Probably the Penguins. Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, but yeah, this year I executive produced No End in Sight, and uh, so to some extent I'm, I'm competing against myself. But they're in a way kind of two sides. Of, they they provide a rather complete picture of the arrogance, incompetence, and uh, ignorance. Of the Bush administration, so you know I'm happy to. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about uh, No End in Sight for a second. Now, that's a film uh, that explores in great detail, detail kind of the the nuts and bolts of how things worked or how things didn't work in the first months of the U.S. occupation of Iraq. And Charles Ferguson, the director. I don't think he would dispute the characterization that he's something of a policy wonk. And I think that separates him from the more partisan political filmmakers like uh, Michael Moore and Robert Greenwald, both of whom I respect a great deal. Yeah. But it's a, it's, a, um, it's a more sort of closely nuanced uh, portrait and more objective portrait of what went wrong. Do you see yourself as in that category of the quote unquote policy wonk? How would you distinguish yourself? From Charles Ferguson and from No End in Sight, which is also, I think, you know, one of the great documentaries of, of this uh, horrific occupation. Well, I, I'm more of a filmmaker than a policy wonk, and I tend to go into subjects without knowing that much. And I suppose that's both a blessing and a curse. It's a curse because it, it means I, I have to spend hour after hour after hour trying to get these very complicated uh, facts and ideas into my head. But I think it's a blessing in the sense that. Uh, I'm able to see the stories and find uh, vehicles for, for some of this rather complex information. Because at the end of the day, uh, I see what I do as being a movie maker. And if you can't engage viewers in a story, then you haven't really done your job. If I had a, a role to play in Charles's film, it's definitely Charles's film, uh, and, it's, and it's a good one. Uh, but my role was to encourage him to 
uh, pay more attention to character and, and narrative drive. So drawing sort of a clean line, a clean narrative line. That's right, and, and to make sure that, that the that the talking heads are actually integrated into the narrative, so you understand who they are. You see photographs of them. You understand how they how they worked, uh, what roles they played, uh, that kind of thing. And it, I think it makes a difference because then people don't float as talking heads. They're you know they become characters in a story. Now the line, the narrative line here is 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 complicated. It's quite a weave. At the same time, you have a very very clear point of entry. You have Dilawar. How did you? Uh, learn the story about Delaware. How did you decide that he was going to be the way into this vast and, and volatile, very emotional subject? Well, I was looking for a, a vehicle or a vessel. You know, some people approached me and said, "You want to make a film about torture?" Well, you know, torture is an important subject. Some people approached you. Who who were they? Well, uh, I was on a panel for Enron, and uh, a high net worth attorney approached me. He had nothing to do with. Um, Torture, or he wasn't a civil liberties attorney. He was a real estate attorney, actually, a guy named Don Glasgow, very uh, for a white shoe firm in New York. But he was very upset about this, and he said, "If I help raise some of this money, will you um, make the film?" I said, "You know, cautiously, sure." But you know, to say you're going to make a film about torture is one thing. As you start to think about it, I mean, <laughs> you don't want to torture the audience, and and you can't make a film. I don't think. A, a, about some theme in an abstract way. Films tend to be about people and emotions. So, you know, I, I had to find a way to tell the story. And I, and I, I read a piece by Tim Golden of the New York Times, um, uh, also reported earlier by Carlotta Gall of the New York Times. But Tim's piece was the one I, I read first. And what struck me about Tim's story was both that Ed Dillard was a pure innocent. That was one thing. Um, but also there was something at the, toward the end of Tim's story that really struck me, which was there was a five-day interrogation of Dilawar before he died. He was murdered uh, brutally uh, by his guards. After the third day, they concluded that he was innocent, and yet they kept beating him. And that testified to me to the kind of momentum of torture that was really upsetting and a kind of corruption of the human spirit that interested me. The third thing about Dilawar that was important was there was a way in which his story fed into the larger picture of the Bush administration's policy of torture. You know, the interrogators at Bagram went on to Abu Ghraib right after that. In fact, it was they were the ones who were setting a lot of the policy when the Abu Ghraib, Abu Ghraib scandal broke. Right, there was a female sergeant. A female who, captain named female captain, captain Carolyn Wood. Who was in charge of the 519th. Who would not speak to you. Who would not speak to you. We tried very, very hard. We followed her from, you know, to, to Arizona, where she was at Fort Huachuca, to Korea, where she was... She the, was sort of the virus in this whole she thing. She was the virus. And virus is a good way of describing this, because it, it's like, this is almost like 26 days later, this film. You discover that this virus takes over, and it mutates, and it migrates, and it provokes a lot of um, rather grisly violence. So, um, you know, uh, what? but interestingly enough, so her team gets promoted after the murder of Dilawar and indeed one other detainee in, in, in detention. Which has not, uh, to be clear, been publicized yet. The golden piece is not, is not out yet when she receives her promotion. That's right. That took That's about right. two years, That's correct, right. after the murder. That's correct. That's correct. It was, after the death. It, it was very, the, you know, right after the death, or pretty soon right after the death, she goes, or the two deaths, she's shipped to Abu Ghraib. Tim Golden's piece doesn't come out until well after... Abu Ghraib, when a lot of people began to look into a, a, a lot of what was going on. Um, but the other thing about that, so, so it connected Bagram to Abu Ghraib. And then the weird thing, too, is that the passengers in Dilawar's taxi, there were three passengers, all being taken by Dilawar back to his little village of Yakubi near the Pakistan border. They were shipped off to Gitmo and stayed there for 15 months. And for no real reason, really. I, my view is that, you know, it was a cover up that uh, they had uh, killed somebody who was an, a pure innocent, but rather than admit that they had done that, uh, indeed the army initially reported that he died of natural causes. This is a guy whose legs were pulpified. You know, yes, take, that's, that's, let's be clear about that. He was whacked, repeat, in addition to being uh, chained up for, for hours and hours and hours, he was uh, beaten on the thighs, which is apparently a... Uh, it's called a, a perennial strike, technique. perennial strike. And right. they, they, some of the guards had one day of training, and they learned this one strike where you knee somebody in the thigh. There's a lot of nerve endings there, and it causes somebody to crumple if you knee them hard enough. 
Right. You are. But this is, and this caused, and apparently you say in the film that he would probably have never walked again. The Army coroner believed that his legs would have had to have been amputated had he survived. Because we have to remember that his wounds were exacerbated by the fact that he was being hung by his hands from the steel mesh in the isolation booth in which he's being kept hour after hour after hour. And this was part of a low-maintenance sleep deprivation program that they were conducting at Bagram. But in the case of Dilawar, what happened is that it caused blood to flow to his legs. And so these knee strikes, which he may have survived otherwise, he had no way of doing because, you know, already that forced standing is a kind of torture technique that the Soviets learned and taught us, and taught the Central Intelligence Agency. But as a pure physical thing, all this blood was rushing to his legs. He was being pounded repeatedly. And then, you know, the army coroner, in fact, declared his death a homicide. And that's how this investigation began, because one of the, one of the, uh, New Carlotta Gall, in a uh, New York Times reporter in Afghanistan, went up to see the family, uh, and the, his body as it had been returned along with a death certificate, and they couldn't read it. Now, she read it, and then it said homicide. Before we go up the chain of command here, let's, let's talk a little bit about what it was like for you. I assume that you looked at a lot of very grisly photos of torture. I'll say that the, uh, the image, the very famous image of the, the, the man in white, the hooded man in white with his arms spread, is a, a mythic image of horror. I mean, it, it, it looks like some, something out of uh, Goya's uh, Disasters of War. Uh, but you, in, in addition to that, had to look at some very, very graphic material. What was that like? How did you decide how much of that to use in the film? It was a tough thing to figure out. <laughs> we looked at some pretty grisly images, and I will say that my editor and I, over time, found ourselves being uh, sort of dispirited. You know, it, it would gnaw at us. You know, you'd see, look at those images day in and day out, and it, it, uh, it gets to you. But it also desensitizes you. And there was a period where we would put images in the film. We'd show it to other people in the cutting room, and they were outraged. And they said, you can't show that image. It's too brutal. Right. Um, and so we, we had to try to find a, 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 a balance between images that uh, shock us because they're so brutal and they offend our, our sense of decency, our, our sense of morality, but at the same time not so brutal that they actually cause us to shut off, or the viewer to shut off, and they say, I, I just can't look at it. I mean, this is, a, this is a really complicated issue, because I know that I was very much of two minds about Brian De Palma's use of actual Iraqi atrocity footage, dead children, dead babies, dead, right. dead women, at the, at the end of his film, Redacted. I felt that given that it was a fictional film, uh, that, that these photos coming at the end had no place. But the other part of me said, wait a minute, he wants to shock us, he wants to outrage us, he wants to send us out of there uh, furious. You know, ha does this uh, go beyond, you know, exploitation and, and, and qualify as a sort of meaningful uh, political action, the, the making of this film? I could never resolve that. I would be surprised if very many other people could. Well, I haven't seen Redacted. I know about it, and I know about the legal battle in terms of whether or not um, he should have been able to show the images or whether you know, they, they should have been redacted. Uh, uh, but I haven't seen the film, so I, I can't comment. But it's an, it, it just raises will, that issue. It, it is a, it's a touchy and, and very difficult issue, and we were conscious about it, too, because you don't want to be in the business of just putting the images in for pure shock value. Uh, right. One of the things that we tried to do with the images, and you could, Abu Ghraib, we don't spend that much time in Abu Ghraib. We show some rather grisly, um, you know, cell phone movies of a guy with a hood on his head being forced to masturbate for the camera. Another guy literally beating his head, almost trying to kill himself on the, on the, uh, on the door of a prison cell. Um, but in addition, a lot of the images that we showed had a couple of purposes. One was to kind of shock us at, at their horror, but also to show through the Abu Ghraib images and their connection with what we know about now Guantanamo and Bagram, that this wasn't the work of a few bad apples. There were things that... Uh -huh. um, bad apples being, you know, the, the phrase used by uh, 
Donald Rumsfeld right. and I believe Dick Cheney to account for Lindy England and, and the photos that emerged from Abu Ghraib, correct? That's right. The bad apples have done this. Well, and that, there was nothing that anybody could do from a political perspective. Once those photos, some of those photos came out of Abu Ghraib, thanks to the Seymour Hersh article and also 60 Minutes, too. Um, so what the administration tried to do was to focus all the attention on that incident, as if to say, okay, here's one time where some bad apples, you know, did some bad things, were horrified, we're sorry, let's move on. Uh, in fact, you know, I think what happens in taxi is we're able with the images to show that these images migrated and that these practices migrated from place to, from Guantanamo to Abu Ghraib, from Bagram to Abu Ghraib. So you see these images and the first time you see them all you see is horror and then you see them, you know, these, these people chained naked to the beds with underwear on their heads you realize, oh, I saw that in Guantanamo. Oh, you know, it's like you're beginning to realize that there are connections here. So in the horror, there's a kind of visceral understanding of a, a broader tacit policy at work. Well, before we get into that policy, let me uh, stick to the tortures for, for a second. Now, you, one of your great camera objects, I use the word great advisedly, is a man named Damien Corsetti, who right. is a, a kind of bald behemoth. Uh, in the film, though, of course, we do not see him actually torturing, so he, he emerges as a kind of Lenny-like gentle giant who, who doesn't quite understand how he got to this point. I'm wondering if, if you at any point were able to feel empathy for him, to put yourself, to, to see what happened through his eyes and through the eyes of the other, uh, the other um, U.S. interrogators who were indicted and, and tried for the murder of Dilawar, and, and whether or not you, you, or whether or not you, you just could not go that far, you could not get into the head of people who could inflict that kind of pain for that, that amount of time. Well, I think one of the things that happened was I actually went through a, um, you know, more of a process than I originally thought, because I, you know, coming to the story from Tim Golden's piece, uh, I felt it was my duty to try to talk to these guys, both the guards who were supposed to protect Dilawar and ended up torturing him, and the interrogators who interrogated him. Um, but I didn't expect to feel sympathetic toward them at all. And yet after I talked to them, and I interviewed them at great length, and it took a while to get them to talk, but once they talked, we, they talked at great length, I found myself deeply sympathetic. Um, because I felt that, well, you couldn't excuse what they had done. Some of them had done horrible things. And I should point out that Damien Corsetti is n was never, was found innocent of all charges. But uh, I think it's fair to say that Damien saw some stuff that all of us would be revolted by, at the very least. Um, but I think I became deeply sympathetic because I sensed that they were thrust into a situation and encouraged to do things that they really weren't prepared for and really didn't want to do. One interrogator told me his sergeant, his superior officer, said, okay, time to take that uh, guy out of his comfort zone. And he was referring to Dilawar, meaning you haven't been rough enough with him, so rough him up. Mm -hmm. um, in the filmmaking, I realized in one cut that we had gone too far. We had made them too sympathetic, and actually we had to put back some material that we knew about. Mm -hmm. You know, For example, Willie Brand... Uh, a very sympathetic uh, guard. Yes. Uh, Who had actually very, left the army and then was surprised. He was out of the army and then years you know, later. after Abu Ghraib came up, he felt that uh, you know they were reaching around trying to punish other people to show that the army could really do it. A show you know. trial after the Time That's magazine right. cover and the... That's right. right. And I think so you can say that the proceeding was calculated to um, uh, to have a political impact. At the same time, Willie did some stuff that's not so pleasant to recall, and uh, we included some of those details. The fact that Willie kicked uh, poor Dilawar in the leg so many times that his leg got tired and he had to switch to the other one to resume. So I felt we had to put those details in because it's not right to see some of these guys as pure victims, but I think it's entirely justified to see them as scapegoats because they bore the brunt of the punishment and the people who condone their behavior and who sometimes ordered it, uh, got off scot free. It is, it is this mystery. I, I was reading this uh, book called Deer Hunting with Jesus by a, uh, by a blogger named Joe Bajant, and a uh, great book uh, edited by my wife. 
But uh, it has a wonderful chapter on uh, that begins with Lindy England and talks about the culture, the West Virginia culture out of which she emerged, mm -hmm. uh, her attempts to prove herself in the Army, falling in love with a rather mm -hmm. uh, sadistic colleague of hers, and how she could have get to that to that point. And then what happened is, you know, this this poster girl, this 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 sadistic monkey-like girl that you see in these photos em emerged as, as very human, not exactly sympathetic. Right. But you could almost see what happened given what came from above. That's and right. I guess my next question is, explain the phrase, the fog of ambiguity, mm -hmm. as it relates to Bagram, Abu Ghraib, and then um, Guantanamo. Sure. It's, it's a phrase that I believe is coined by Lawrence Wilkerson, the former chief of staff to Colin Powell. Who's also in no end in sight. Right. So he's sort of made a career of doing your... Well, I think he's talking movie. out now. I think he was the guy who felt outraged by a lot of things, and now he has permission to talk about whether or not he's <coughs> speaking in some indirect way for Colin Powell. We don't know. But, um, ah, no, but that's an interesting question. It's possible. Um, you know, I, I think Colin Powell is a good soldier. I don't think he. I'm not saying Lawrence is a bad soldier. I'm just saying that I think that, that in some ways, uh, Colin Powell feels he can't speak out in any way. Whether or not Lawrence Wilkerson is doing his own thing, or in some way, doing some of what Colin Powell wishes he might be able to do, I, I don't or had know, done, I, or had <laughs> done. I'm just speculating. But, um, but. Uh, Larry Wilkerson uses the phrase fog of ambiguity, and basically what that meant was that at the same time that uh, uh, Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld are exerting tremendous pressure on soldiers to get intelligence, soldiers and CIA agents to get intelligence, they're also making it clear, which is sort of ironic, they're making it clear that the rules aren't clear anymore. Mm. that we can't really depend on the Geneva Conventions. Maybe they apply, maybe they don't apply. Maybe the executive, the chief executive, i.e. the President of the United States, has, as Commander-in-Chief, total uh, authority to do whatever it is he wants to do. So maybe all oh, this is okay. And, and so in this, if I can interrupt for saying they're taking their cues from John Yoo and the infamous torture memorandum, and John Yoo, amazingly enough, agreed to be interviewed for the film. That's right. Well, I think there was a period of time where John Yoo was um, a kind of, um, whether he decided on his own or whether the administration wanted to put him forward, he was proud of what he had done. And he was going on McNeil, Lair, and other program to, um, to say, yeah, what's the big deal? I mean, we we're fighting a war, a war against terror, this new kind of enemy that had never been seen before. Uh, we weren't prepared. We couldn't observe Geneva Conventions, which demand that you give people a tobacco ration. Can't do that got to be able to rough him up. The president has to be able to do what he needs to do. And he would do unbelievable things now that we know a, a little bit about the kind of stuff he was doing in the boiler room of the Office of Legal Counsel, which is the place where they interpret laws for the executive branch. Was this retroactive of uh, following uh, these processes that had begun, or did uh, Cheney and Rumsfeld turn to him in advance to make sure that, that you know, they, could, they could justify this? We know that very early on, the Office of Legal Counsel was very much involved in trying to interpret, or other people would say, uh, retrofit uh, rules so that uh, this new dark side approach right. would be legal. Because in some of the conversations that we do know about, uh, a lot of people in the White House and in the uh, Justice Department were concerned that what uh, Cheney and uh, his... Um, key aide David Addington and others wanted to do were amounting to war crimes and they had to be very careful about how they defined them. So they were thinking about that very early on and at that time Alberto Gonzalez was then counsel uh, to the president. So they were very concerned that they might be considered culpable and when John Yu writes his uh, famous torture memo which comes out I believe in August of 02, this torture memo redefines torture out of existence. And he finds <laughs> a, a definition out of a medical statute for what severe pain is. And he says, well, in this medical statute, severe pain is um, organ failure or uh, pain that results in death. Um, you know, and, and then he uses also an intentionality. So you had to intentionally inflict pain that would be equivalent to organ failure or even death. If you, didn't, if you did it by accident, that's okay um, in order for it to be called torture. So he basically defined torture out of existence. 
So here's a question for you, speaking of empathy. You stare at the face of Dick Cheney. You stare at the face of Donald Rumsfeld. To me, when I do that, I can't go there. There's this black, this enormous black hole there. Somewhere the idea that extreme torture, waterboarding, death as, a, as collateral damage was, you know, was not only going to be tolerated but tacitly encouraged. Where does this come from? Is there a true belief there that it's going to be effective, that it's going to help win the war on terror? I mean, I can't wrap my mind around this. I'm, the film doesn't quite, you know. No, again, well, we're limited by just the fo those photos and then the footage that we see. Well, always, it's going to be hard to know, ever. I mean, we don't know exactly what the answer to the question of why is. But I was always haunted by the question of why. Because the fact is that there's a tremendous body of evidence which shows that torture is notoriously unreliable as an intelligence gathering tool. You can torture people and you can get people to talk, but the question is, what will they say? And uh, they tend to say whatever it is that the interrogator wants to hear. Now, did Dick Cheney just not know about this body of evidence? Um, I think, and, and this is somewhat speculation on my part, but I do believe that, uh, you know, with the shock of 9-11, that he was determined to strike back. And that what he did was a combination of ignorance, arrogance, and incompetence. Because they didn't really know um, the body of evidence, and they didn't really care, seemingly. Um, but people in the field were telling him, okay, we can get more information if the gloves come off. What concerns me, particularly as we follow torture through the process of, you know, the, the, the halls of government, and particularly into the Department of Justice now, where the new Attorney General, Michael Mukasey, refuses to say that waterboarding is a crime, is that does torture have a kind of political motivation, either conscious or unconscious, right. where, lo and behold, whenever you torture somebody, they tell you exactly what you want to hear, and that happens to be good for policy. And in the film, we show the um, we show the case of this guy Ibn Sheikh Al Libi, who in fact was one of the linchpins of Colin Powell's testimony before Congress justifying the invasion of Iraq. Correct. That's right. With completely bogus and which with what has been proved to be completely bogus information. That's right. And, and would you remind us what that well, what that was about the links between Saddam and Al Qaeda? That's right. Because interestingly enough. Uh, they ca captured Al Libby and they were interrogating. The FBI was interrogating him in Bagram according to Miranda rules. They were getting information that was good information. It was slow going, uh, but the executive branch didn't like how slow it was, how long it was taking, and also they didn't like the information. Hmm. So they. Uh, Rumsfeld and presumably Cheney would have access presumably, to this. Presumably, that's right. And, um, and so they turn it over to the CIA. They turn his interrogation over to the CIA. The CIA wraps him up in duct tape, stuffs him in a small cardboard box. They uh, tell him they're going to have unlawful carnal knowledge with his mother. And then they ship him off to Cairo where he's waterboarded by Egyptian authorities. And uh, he gives information that Saddam Hussein was training al-Qaeda in um, uh, in all sorts of uh, you know poison gas and and, uh, and and dangerous activities, this then you know is what Colin Powell uses right. to uh, launch the uh, launch the Iraq War. I, I think I would have told them that I was yeah. training that <laughs> Al Qaeda. Well, I, I think what we're discovering. I mean, they talk about Halid Sheikh Mohammed, another guy who is who is waterboarded. Uh, and, and who now is, is going to be trial. Going to actually go to trial. That's right? right. And they talk about all the things that, that he confessed to. The fact is, if you look at Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, what he confessed to, he confessed to everything but murdering Santa Claus. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. Uh, no, I, I mean, it, sometimes it's funny. I mean, Santa Claus just, has been murdered on South Park, but right. we didn't really think that we were in South Park territory. I guess, I guess there's no fictional treatment of this that can quite match what Well, sometimes it does go there. I mean, it is a pretty dark side, but the dark humor that pops up is, you know, ultimately I ended up cutting some of it out, but uh, we did run across this um, incident where we discovered that they were force-feeding detainees in Guantanamo by using these restraint chairs, where they get the restraint chairs. Apparently, some very, you know, 
go-to character at Guantanamo went on the internet and discovered there was a website called www.restraintchair.com. And sure enough, a, a sheriff in Denison, Iowa, was manufacturing them um, for you know restraining people who are on crank who come in or completely right. uncontrollable for a couple of hours, and then they let them go. And, and so the U.S. used it for uh, well, suddenly you had this huge order from the Operation Enduring Freedom. That's what they do to uh, to ducks to make foie gras, correct? <laughs> they just swell their livers and. Uh, that's just horrific. Well, tell us about, um, speaking of horrific, tell us about the cult of 24 and the so-called ticking time bomb scenario, which has actually been cited by, uh, by no less than Alan Dershowitz, a so-called liberal, as being, as justifying uh, extreme interrogation or, or torture. Well, even more than Alan Dershowitz, recently he was cited by Antonin Scalia. Uh, to talk well, that to I would him. expect, but it's scary. <laughs> um, but... Uh, this ticking time bomb scenario is a kind of hypothetical intellectual argument that is to me the bane of existence for anybody who's opposed to torture because somehow everybody imagines this possibility where you've got the terrorist in hand and so uh, and, and, and he knows where the atomic bomb is so if you just torture him you know, he'll tell you where it is and millions of lives will be saved. And in that context, you say, well, geez, we've got to do it, right? The fact is, it's never happened. It's never happened. And w once you go down that road and decide, okay, this is the ticking time bomb scenario that's got to be the logic for what it is that we do, but we'll only do it in those ticking time, scenario, ticking time bomb scenarios. Well, the next thing you know, jaywalking is a potential ticking time bomb scenario because the jaywalker, we picked him up, we think he knew where the bomb was, you know, everything becomes an excuse for torture. It's this idea of, of the virus, it migrates. And um, so you have, a, you, you have a scenario that really doesn't exist. It's as if we based our uh, Department of Defense on a possible attack from Mars. It's never happened. It's possible, but it's never possible. happened. But well, it's it happened in the movies. Right. And in fact, the ticking time bomb That's scenario right. happens probably every Week night. Right. Every right. night on uh, network television. And That's in fact, right. we have to, it's unfortunate that as a film critic, I have to, con I have to be the killjoy who says, uh, yeah, this is, this is a, you know, 24, uh, when it doesn't stray into absurdity, which is just about every week, is actually a pretty exciting show. It's like, yeah, Jack Bauer, come on, you know. You I've know, talked to Sybil Lewis who love the show. Well, uh, but, it's, but it's pernicious. I it mean, is. it's something that we, we, we have to be able to admit enjoying so that we don't sound like, like party poopers. But at the same time, we have to say the, impl the political implications cannot be underestimated. More than the political implications, Jane Mayer wrote an interesting piece in The New Yorker about how um, uh, Dean Finnegan from West Point actually went out to Hollywood to try to persuade them to stop because they were trying to teach the recruits at, at, at right. uh, the, um, you know, the, the, their students at West Point that, um, that rapport building is really the best way to get information. Uh, but they weren't listening because it seemed to them that, you know, this is just, you're just old school pops. They want to be Jack Bauer. They want to be Jack Bauer. I mean, it, it's, it's interesting how, how the culture, how, how certain uh, aspects of popular culture can reinforce and create an appetite for, for these things. And, right. and you know, just for, for purely mercenary reasons, because, of course, they know that this is going to sell. Well, it's emotionally satisfying. I mean, right. we're scarred by what happened to us on 9-11. So Jack Bauer is the vessel by which we get retribution. We pay them back. Payback. Payback right. is, is the rule. Well, which brings us actually to probably my favorite part of the movie, because simply because I'd never seen anything like it before, which is special FBI agent Jack Clunan, who says about three or four things that made me really just want to confess every sin to him I'd ever committed. He says, <laughs> he, he says this is how I would interrogate somebody. I would say... Look, uh, you got yourself into into a really terrible spot here. Do you want your children to be educated? We'll educate them. You know, do you want us to take care of your family? We'll take care of them. Do you want to figure out some scenario by which you can one day go home or at least settle this and spare yourself and your family a lot of pain? Help me with this. Help me figure out a way to get you out of there. And I was going like, 
well, you know, I, uh, uh, you know, I'm there. I'm yours. Uh, it was an extraordinary. It was very brief. At the same time, it was extraordinary, and I would think it would be worth, you know, ten waterboarding sessions. Well, the fact is, he shows how it's done. How it's how it's done without torture. And Am I being naive? No, I don't think so. I think it can be done. Now there are there are CIA agents who will say no. We need to torture these guys because otherwise we don't get the information and we get it quickly. So I'm not saying that everybody agrees. There are CIA agents who, you know, when one went on Brian Ross's show uh, on ABC not too long ago, waterboarding works. Um, I don't believe it. I don't believe there's no alternative to waterboarding. And Jack Clunan proves it. And the FBI proves it. And other people, experienced interrogators, uh, know how to get information out of people. Um, and you know, there's a kind of basic assumption that Cheney et al. made um, at the beginning, which was these people are fanatics. And because they're fanatics, the normal rules of humanity don't apply, i.e., they're not really human beings like the rest of us. But Jack Clunan's view and the view of the FBI counterterrorism uh, force was that they are like us. Mm -hmm. They may speak a different language, they may grow up in a different culture, but ultimately everybody cares about the future of their children. Uh, ultimately everybody cares. Now, there, there may be some deep, deep, deep-seated fanatics that you can't do anything with. I'm not even sure torture works. Well, Mohammed, Mohammed Atta, for example, I mean, can you make the case? I mean, do you feel that you have an obligation to be able to make the case for the other side, to, to say that in some situations, you know, it might be justified. There are some people who indeed will resist just about everything, uh, short of turning them into, into uh, short of pulpifying them. Or are you not prepared it's possible. to go that far? I mean, it's possible that, that they can, but I think even Al-Qaeda um, has said that when somebody's in custody for a certain period of time, they forgive them. They don't hold it against them if they talk. Because everybody talks. That's why I have to laugh whenever Dick Cheney sits there and says, I'm not prepared to discuss interrogation techniques because that would be aiding the enemy. Yeah. Okay. Waterboarding, right? Okay, you know you're going to be waterboarding. Now, when you start to drown, are you prepared now? Are you going to be able to resist? When somebody starts to pull your fingernails out, uh, because you know it might happen, are you prepared to resist? No. I don't think there's any mantra, <laughs> you know, in the world that can get you through having your fingernails pulled off. But no. I have to say, yeah, I John McCain, never had you know that. from John McCain, torture works in the sense that it causes you to talk. How much you say, what you say, all of that, you know, uh, is in the details. But it, it, at, at some point, torture does get you to talk. It, 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 but is it good information? And it's right. not. And is it necessary? Right. And I would argue no. And I argue that particularly because you see what happens when torture, the virus, takes over. Because suddenly not only is information, false information entering the system, but also torture becomes a kind of mechanism of corruption where you end up, because you keep getting this feedback loop of stuff you want to hear, yeah. you end up covering up mistakes, covering up your own illegality. And the next thing you know, you have Michael Mukasey saying, I'm not really sure we can say that waterboarding is torture or if it's illegal. And there are two, you know, larger, larger and more troubling implications, as you point out in the film. Or the first, I don't know if you, if you pointed out in the film that then, then if you do this sort of thing, then you have no way of invoking the Geneva Convention to protect your own Correct. soldiers when they're captured. You don't have the moral high ground anymore. And second, you create tens of thousands of people who hate you because That's they right. all know stories of, of there, there are always people they know, maybe their relatives, maybe themselves, who've been subjected to this kind of thing and, and who had done nothing wrong. You have to wonder. I mean, we say that we're on a crusade to uh, bring democracy to the world. What does it look like when, as crusaders, our key tool is torture? And that doesn't really look very good. It doesn't look like we're being very consistent. And Jack Clunan has told me that he's in touch through the Witness Protection Program with some Al-Qaeda operatives who have blood on their hands. Uh, and he says that they assure him that torture that we've inflicted is not only a great recruiting tool for them, but it has given them an unquenchable thirst for revenge. Right. That's the last right. thing I think we really have to remember about this torture thing is that Osama bin Laden has stated 
and most terrorists would agree that the goal of terror is not to acquire territory. The goal of terror is to provoke liberal democratic societies to act like tyrannies, to undermine their own principles. Well, in the words of George Bush, mission accomplished. Yeah, well, and, and then you have George Bush and Dick Cheney and ending up as the the poster boys for uh, for recruitment for uh, not just Al Qaeda but but for for other uh, seemingly more moderate organizations. Right. We have to ask ourselves: When Osama bin Laden effectively endorsed John Kerry, was he really endorsing John Kerry, or did he know enough about the American public to believe that he was really endorsing George Bush? Oh boy, I don't want to go into that one. Well, uh, finally, um, uh, you mentioned John McCain. Uh, now, in light of uh, of the surge, or what uh, Harry Shearer calls the soyge. Um, you know, McCain, uh, along with some other politicians, have done this, this flip-flop uh, on the issue of torture and find themselves now, in fact, uh, making the case for it, uh, saying that we should be in Iraq for a thousand years if, right. if necessary. Um, do, you, do you think this is, this is illusory, you know, the effect of the surge? Do you think that, that this is going to have any legs? Uh, or, or do you think, in fact, that, that, you know, more and more of these horror stories are going to be coming out uh, in, the, in the months and the years ahead? We're quickly getting into an area that exceeds my rather limited competence. But I will say this, I, I think the one danger, uh, you know, I was never, Charles Ferguson actually was interested in, in you know, had arguments for why the, the invasion of Iraq was theoretically a good thing. I, I didn't share that view. Uh, I, I don't think we ever should have invaded. However, I am concerned that a precipitous withdrawal could end up being a disaster, a human rights disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, there's a mess there, and I'm not sure... There's an easy answer as to how to clean it up. But the idea that suddenly now Iraq should be a military base for the United States into the distant future, I think that's a serious mistake. And Congress has signed off on, on at least the, the president's right to, to keep you know, these techniques secret. I think that Congress, you know, two, two of the most chilling moments in the film for me are when Congress rise, Congress rises up as one both sides of the aisle, to cheer uh, President Bush when he, he makes two pretty objectionable remarks. Uh, and I think Congress has been all too complicit, I'm afraid. Those remarks are? Well, one time he said, uh, uh, let's just say they're no longer a problem for the United States of America, meaning we basically yeah. murdered people. Yeah. And, and, and the other one is, one by one, the terrorists are learning the meaning of American justice. Okay, now this is after we know. Sounds like Buford Pusser in Walking <laughs> Tall, doesn't it? Well, but, but we know by now how many innocent people are in Guantanamo. I'm not saying they're all innocent. There are a lot of people who should be in some kind of prison. I'm just saying that, that the system as developed by, by George Bush and Dick Cheney was not the traditional American system of justice. It was a kind of system of kangaroo courts uh, designed only to make themselves look good. Um, so, you know, but, but, but because Dick Cheney and George Bush uh, were so good at, at manipulating our fear in the wake of 9-11, I think Congress uh, was weak in opposing that because they couldn't show a, um, an effective counter-argument. They didn't have a counter-argument that said there's a different way of being strong against terror. Uh, so they, they were com somewhat complicit in, in, in the way that George Bush... Yes. Used there is the Supreme Court actually that acted as the check against some of what um, uh, Cheney and, and Bush and Rumsfeld were trying to do. Well, finally, Alex, uh, tell me a little bit about uh, the impact that you hope that the film will have. Uh, uh, in many cases, um, unfortunately, you're you're preaching to the choir. Uh, I always say that that maybe you are, but it, it's in the hopes that the choir will then sing louder. But it's a good song, right? Uh, but. Um, you know, what, what is your hope in, in terms of the impact of this film, in terms of it reaching, you know, what we say is the hearts and minds of the American people, making them rethink some of their knee-jerk um, uh, positions on this, 24 uh, encouraged uh, positions on this issue, and, and do, you, do you see the film having an impact? I do, and I, I hope it does. I mean, I know it's a difficult topic. I think for many Americans it's just hard to imagine that this is who we are. But to me, 
This was a film that was all about the corruption of the American character. Uh, I see as my, you know, as what I see as my greatest, I don't want to say victory, but I can't think of a better word for it, but I know, for example, that there are many people who've seen this film, retired generals, are, general, are, are generally uh, huge fans. General Taguba, I'm told, has seen the film. Uh, Isn't he in Siberia now? Or uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't the Bush administration <laughs> send him to the ends of the earth to make sure there was... Uh, there, there, that kind of honesty did not uh, exist in the Pentagon? Anymore. Well, this is the problem. And, but I, I do think there are many in the military who feel that you know, fundamental and rather fair-minded military values were transgressed here, that, that for very practical reasons these were bad policies. Yes. Um, the, the film is now being shown to the Army JAG school you know, for, for, uh, for kids coming up. And I, as I understand it right now, it's part of a debate in Congress, where uh, there was a recent law that was passed by both the House and the Senate that um, tried to make the Army Field Manual the ruling uh, law of what you can and can't do in interrogations for every government agency, which would include the CIA. And uh, President Bush is threatening to veto it, and they don't have enough votes at the moment to override the veto. I'm told that the film is having an impact there. Um, that's good, and I and for people who come out to see the film. Uh, that's having uh, an impact too. I think people are not as aware as I thought they were about what had been done in our names. And I, you know, I think for patriotic reasons, they're very upset because we're going to need to go forward into the future and figure out a way to reckon with what we've done. So I, I think it's had an impact on a pretty broad spectrum of people. Because of the subject, it hasn't reached the, the vast numbers yes. I would have hoped. Maybe, you know, if, if we're lucky enough to win on Sunday night, maybe that will help. But, uh, but in terms of, of speaking to a broad spectrum of, uh, of, of people, both conservative and liberal, I think it's done a pretty good job. I'm actually more encouraged to hear you talk about the Army. If the Army has the capacity, uh, is, is allowed uh, to, to screen the film, uh, for for its officers, for its students, then uh, that gives me a great deal of hope that uh, they will at least develop some uh, checks and balances within their own minds uh, for you know when this fog of ambiguity exists in the, the future. Well, now, I mean, it was the, just a, quickly. It was the JAG officers who originally brought some of this stuff to everybody's attention. They were right, the ones who were right. outraged, uh, right. and that the civilian leadership was going in this direction. Anyway. Right. Now, I'm, uh, again, I'm very grateful. I'm David Edelstein of, the, of uh, New York Magazine, and uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to interview Alex Gibney, who has something to tell you about uh, Blogging Heads TV. Yes, I should uh, say, by uh, way of full disclosure, that I am an equity participant in bloggingheads.tv, so uh, you can keep that in mind. But I think any Oscar nominee would probably be welcome to have this forum. Uh, Alex, thank you so much for this very enlightening conversation. Great, David. Great to talk to you.